Welcome to this live cast on our future economies. Capitalism, despite the tremendous increase in worldwide welfare through its innovative power and freedom, has at the same time a number of negative consequences. A transition is necessary to overcome ecological destruction, decrease in quality of life and growing inequality. Given geopolitical developments, Europe has an important role to play in this transition. In the live cast, we will start an open dialogue and discuss this transition with internationally renowned economists from all over the world. Questions will pass by, such as Each week, we will discuss these matters with two economists, resulting in 10 online dialogues in 10 weeks, where we will share viewpoints and collect ideas on how capitalism's innovative and creative powers can go hand in hand with fostering an equal and just society. A different subject every week. Together, we can build a basis for economies that are beneficial to all of us. You can participate by putting your questions and remarks in the chat. So, let's talk. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th edition on, and the final version of the series The Future of Capitalism, a series initiated and designed by Moral Markets in collaboration with Pakhuis de Zwijger. And today, instead of asking two international thinkers to join us, we have decided, because this is the last one, to invite uh, four European economics, e economists to join us to reflect on can we actually create a European market economy? And of course, it's already there perhaps, but how can we improve them? And with them, we will talk about this possibility of a European market economy. And we will ask the question, what kind of market economy in Europe will enable societies to flourish? And how can economic policies be steered towards a more inclusive, just and sustainable economy. And moreover, is there a model thinkable which is a serious alternative compared to the US or China uh, uh, model and geopolitical dominance? And finally, perhaps we can even reflect on the question whether we can, despite the different cultures we have among the European Union, we can come to a unifying European economic economic system or model. Okay, and we will do that, as I already mentioned, with four speakers from our beautiful continent. And the first, and we're honored that he's part of uh, our uh, series because um, uh, he's also, he's not only a professor, but also a politician. The first person I would like to introduce is Louis uh, Garigano Gabilondo, and he is a Spanish economist and politician who is currently a member of the European Parliament from Spain, and he's also the Vice President of the Renew Europe and Vice President of the European Political Party, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Before working in Brussels, he was a full professor at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and the London School of Eco Economics. The second person we have invited today is Dalia Marin, and she, uh, uh, she's a professor of the international economics at uh, the Technical University of Munich School of Management, and she's a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. She's also a senior research fellow at Bruegel in Brussels, a European think tank on economic policy in Europe, and a fellow of the European Economic Association. The third is actually from, Bel from Belgium, he's Geert Knowles, and he's the founder and CEO of the Chief Economist of Econopolis. And he's a commentator on financial and economic matters, and after working for 15 years as a Chief Economist at the financial institution, he founded this initiative. He... So he, he won, um, he was awarded with economic shock, awarded the public prize at ABN AMRO for the best non-fiction book uh, in 2000, uh, 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 earlier in 2015. And his newest book is called Gigantism, uh, and that is from 2019. The fourth speaker is 
Tito Bueri. He is an Italian economist and currently professor of economics at Bocconi University in Milan and acts as the scientific direction um, of the Fondazione Rodolfo De Benedetti. He's, he was the cen centennial professor at the London School of Economics, where he's currently the senior visiting professor. Okay, uh, from uh, 2015 to 2019, he was the professor of the Italian Social Security Administration and he's now a scientific advisor of uh, Foundation Rodolfo De Benedetti, where he also served as a scientific director. It's a lot of credentials and it's only to introduce them and to show them we have a lot of knowledge at the table tonight. As we always do in this series, we kick off this session uh, with a, a statement of a young economist. And for this, we go now uh, to this person who's going to introduce the theme of tonight. Please welcome Jim Suri. Good evening, everyone. What kind of market economy do we envision in the future of Europe? That's the central question stated in this final webinar. We can conclude that our current economic and financial system is no longer capable to, so to solve today's global challenges. Namely, the dominant goal in today's economy is defined by profit maximization and economic growth. However, we may have to shift towards a society where well-being is central while restoring the balance of our natural world. As mentioned before, we need a fundamental paradigm shift to give a different answer to the question, how are we doing? In order to have ju a just and equal society, we have to redistribute wealth and make sure that we redesign the economic and financial system so that wealth and power accumulation can no longer occur in the absurd forms we have now. Crucial in this view is the difference between what people deserve and what they actually get. The last couple of months showed, showed us that people we need the most in society are often underpaid and thereby undervalued. That's why we need to fundamentally revalue re the public sector, not by only applauding, but by showing our appreciation via a signif significantly increase of their income. We need a European society where not only shareholders, but every citizen can have a decent say in what's going to happen. This implies a different power balance between markets, the state and society. For example, uh, democratizing private firms via voting entities, which are formed by all stakeholders related to that company, can change the state of mind and lead to different actions others than maximizing profits while neglecting the social and ecological externalities. As for our tax system, I think it makes sense to shift the pressure from labor towards wealth. This will lead to fairer distribution of wealth. And furthermore, in order to end the ongoing tax avoidance by multinationals and individuals, we can harmonize our national tax systems, and simultaneously we can strengthen our European regulations in order to eliminate the tax havens on a worldwide scale. Another crucial part of our new European market economy is the financial system. The current negative dominant function related to our real economy has to transform in a positive and supportive function. This can, by, this can be done via a couple of actions. First of all, via a European public payment and saving infrastructure so that people have a safe way to use and install their money. Secondly, a form of credit guidance by the government so that new money flows to the places where it's actually needed. In other words, to productive and sustainable innovation instead of what we're seeing now, buying existing financial assets or real estate. And lastly, diminish the amount of unproductive and even toxic financial innovations, such as derivatives, via regulation. To conclude, I think we have to realize, <coughs> realize that our European economy and our financial system are not a goal in itself, but a means to an end. In my view, this end 
is defined by human flourishing, where all, where all basic needs of every citizen is fulfilled within the boundaries of our planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. And so let's start the group discussion. And of course, because this is the 10th edition and we have already uh, had a public research, actually, a discussion, ten, nine discussions with all kinds of economists from all over the world, we have deduced some elements which we would like to uh, discuss with you. Three topics. And uh, uh, my colleague David van Overbeek will introduce these topics, uh, which are uh, somehow a summary of what we've done. It's not uh, a, a full summary, but it's the essential, uh, our essential elements of the things we have to discuss with each other. Um, but before um, we're going to go into these three elements, I thought as an introduction, um, it would be nice to ask all of you, all four of you, to, to st a short statement on what you think is the most essential topic we should discuss if you want to reimagine uh, a sustainable, vital, fair market economy. What is the most uh, important either value, institution or practice we have to discuss? And uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, first go to uh, uh, m m Mr. Uh, Professor Garigano Gabilondo. Can you, can you explain to us what would you be your first most essential thing you want to talk about? Well, um, thank you very much. I mean, my, my main concern would be not to throw the baby with the bathwater, like the Americans say, meaning yeah. uh, we are going through a, a crisis um, uh, after very prosperous decades that we had after World War II with a very wide consensus, with societies united, with reforms. Um, the Netherlands, for example, with with the, with the administrations in which uh, Mr. Bokkenstein was and, and Koch and so on. Um, and now the pendulum seems to go in the opposite direction. People are uh, saying that instead of markets, we should go to state aid and state intervention and no competition, but facilitated monopolies. Um, I, I think that nobody thinks that after this crisis, the state should have the right to limit a freedom of movement or, or indefinitely. This is an exceptional thing we are doing now. Um, and similarly, I don't think we should take from this uh, special moment the lesson that the state has to intervene all over the place. Uh, there are two problems, I think two and no more, that we need to tackle. Climate change and increasing inequality. And we can do those two problems by working through the market, um, not by increasing arbitrariness, not by forgetting the lessons of the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, as, as, as we know, uh, we defend the market not because it's just freedom, but because the market is the only way to harvest uh, local knowledge and to make sure that innovation uh, goes forward. People who know what is needed are the people who are on the front lines, not some bureaucrat in some ministry. We shouldn't just suddenly change our minds about that. Clear. So we have to harness the market uh, to, to, to make to make uh, changes. And that means, um, I, in my opinion, companies should maximize profits, given the companies the objective of doing something else simply allows managers to give themselves a big salary and say, well, I didn't make a lot of money, but I was doing some other thing. Um, I think we should, I mean, taxation of wealth, I do agree with that bit that was mentioned. Um, I think that we should harness the market to fight climate change, and that's the emission trading scheme, a very successful scheme that we need to expand worldwide. And we should make sure that the welfare system works without many distortions. And that means not means-tested uh, welfare that introduces all sorts of, uh, of, of problems, but just the general safety net that benefits all citizens and that allows citizens to maintain their freedoms. Clear. Thank you. Just an opening statement, but uh, already uh, enough topics to talk an entire evening about. Um, thank you so much. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Professor Marin. Um. Yeah, you, Sorry. Yeah, you so, can just talk. No, no, I'm talking. I'm on. I'm on. Yes. So my focus is on globalization because uh, the crisis that we are experiencing uh, now um, is actually also um, uh, putting into question globalization. So what I mean by that is that... Um, the supply chains 
uh, have been a distinct feature of globalization. Sub international supply chains are ways of producing in different countries to lower costs, basically. So that is the distinct feature of globalization because 100 years ago, we also had the firms that moved into other countries to produce. But the new thing about globalization is that firms produce, that the, 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 the production process itself has been internationalized in order to exploit uh, lower costs in other countries. And this era of globalization, which has been called hyperglobalization, which started with the fall of the Berlin Wall and ended in, in the financial crisis of 2008, um, this model of producing is under severe um, crisis, if you want so. So we have done some research which shows that uh, this hyperglobalization ended because the financial crisis has put um, made these international supply chains more costly. The reason why it made it more costly is because there was a rise in uncertainty after the financial crisis. Uh, and this substantial increase in uncertainty uh, made these uh, supply chains more fragile because now firms must have expected that with a certain probability, the input that they expected would not be delivered. And that is costly for the firm. And this, at the same time, the financial crisis led to a dramatic drop in interest rates because central banks tried to fight the, the, um, the adverse effects of the crisis. So this uh, fall in interest rates made, made the adoption of robots uh, less costly because the financing dropped sub substantially. So what the firms did is after the financial crisis, actually they reshored production from the low wage countries back to the rich countries and invested in robots instead. Yeah. Now, with the pandemic, I think this is going to become even more stark because if you have a shock like this, uh, firms start to reevaluate the business model of producing in supply chains and they will just reshore even more so. And I think so we have there will be globalization in the future, but the, the era of hyperglobalization is ending Clear. and has consequences which we should discuss. Yes. And then of course go to experts on shocks, uh, Geert Nools. Uh, uh, Mr. Nulls, um, what is, according to you, the most essential thing we should um, discuss if we want to talk about the future of capitalism, of um, um, a, a European market economy? I think the most important is not to copy uh, the United States or China, yeah. uh, but really think about the, the strengths and the own uh, characteristics of, uh, of Europe. Yeah. And so what I see is too much discussion about we should um, find an answer to uh, the size and the capitalism of the United States or China. Um, and we become a bit like them. But I think we, we have to go back to the roots and treasure uh, the fantastic diversity that we have in uh, in Europe, instead of trying to copy their model and think that uh, all this diversity uh, hampers us uh, in our uh, growth and development, which in my opinion is not the case. Interesting. It, it reflects uh, a lot of the discussions we actually had the past uh, two months uh, in this series. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just as, a, as, as an introduction, uh, let's go to uh, Professor uh, Bueri. Uh, uh, what, what is your answer to, to, to this notion of a, what is essential to discuss if we want to explore a European market economy? 
I think at this stage we should uh, discuss and plan on a smart retreat of a state because uh, in the last few months uh, we really have been experiencing an invasion of a state in uh, uncharted dimensions. It has been ruling over uh, virtually all aspects of uh, our lives. It has been deciding how many person we can invite for dinner. It has decided how long we can stay out at night. However, when we walk uh, in the street, uh, we need to wear a mask. And when uh, it is time, we can take it off if you run a bit more. Uh, and more important, it has been banning all type of layoffs, uh, including individual layoffs. It has been uh, intervening massively in firms, <laughs> paying wages uh, of workers being put on short-time work. It has been <laughs> even deciding whether lifeguards on the beach can practice breath uh, uh, to breath, uh, mouth to uh, mouth. Uh, so, you know, there are things that clearly are unsustainable in the long term. This cannot be gone on for a long no, time. So we should really redefine the border of a state. And I think in defining the border of a state, we can highlight what are the specificity and what Europe can do, unlike Asia or the US. And this is mainly going back to our uh, culture, which is an identity, which is being the land of redistribution. And I think there is also another dimension in addition to redistribution and fight against poverty and inequality. And this is health because there are tremendous differences in life expectancy. And I think that now there is more awareness of importance of the health sector. So these two fields are extremely important in redefining the role of the state, social protection and health policies. Clear. Well, we would now like to discuss three uh, transitions with you. And for that, uh, we have prepared uh, uh, three propositions. And David van Overbeek, my co-host, will introduce uh, um, uh, these topics and, and, and try to find a group discussion uh, uh, wi wi with you. And just uh, let's see if it's possible to just have an open dialogue between, uh, between you four. Um, I would also like to say that we have an audience which can also participate in posing questions. Um, there is an editor, bo uh, editor uh, on these questions, but if you have questions, please post them via Zoom. You can find that button on the program page of Pakhuis de Zwijger. Enter the Zoom environment and then you can uh, use the Q&A button to post questions. Please do so and we will receive the best ones here at our screens at the table and we'll post them to our internet national guests. But for now, the floor is, uh, I hand the floor uh, to David, David van Overbeek, who's going to introduce the three propositions. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight with us. Uh, the first thematic thread that we have seen in the course of this series that we've been making is, the, is, is what I would call institutional transition. Over the course of the last weeks, many of our guests have advocated some form of democratization of large companies in order to outbalance a kind of narrow-minded focus on shareholder interests and profiteering. First off, for example, Luigi Zingales, he takes a laissez-faire approach to institutional transitions and tries to persuade managers and investors that it is in fact in their best interest to focus on maximizing shareholder welfare, not wealth. Isabella Ferreiras, on the other hand, she brought up the notion of bicameralism, by which a large firm's power will be divided among both the capital and labor investors in order for workers to get more influence in a firm's decision making. And lastly, Colin Mayer has proposed yet another different approach, being disappointed by the discrepancy between the agreement reached at the Business Roundtable in 2019 and the behavior of large firms during the corona crisis. He thinks firms should in some way judicially be held accountable for their purpose or social mission statements. And these remarks and this thematic threat has led us to the following proposition, which I'd like to ask you, all four of you, to respond to And first off. So the first proposition of tonight is Europe must impose reforms to make it possible to hold firms judicially accountable for their social mission statement or their purpose. Could I ask Mr. Gabilondo, to, Professor Gabilondo, to respond to that first? Uh, Luis Garicano, the Spanish have two family names. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, no, strongly no, uh, very strongly no. I, I think that, in my opinion, I, I think that uh, 
what Luigi Singada was pointing out, which is to try to to encourage firms, to try to to tell firms or to help them uh, to push them in the direction of of certain actions is perfectly fine. To make the judiciary accountable for something as vague and as as difficult to measure, like their social purpose, is uh, I think counterproductive because it will increase uncertainty. It will increase. Uh, the the ability to to play games by by directors, uh, contrary to what the statement seems to think, a CEO who has a very simple way to be evaluated, which is uh, is he is he maximizing profits, is he seeking good opportunities, etc., uh, is more accountable than one where we say, well, you should do the good for society. I mean, he starts spending money in things that he likes, like uh, making uh, you know better buildings and uh, spending money in, in luxurious buildings for his company. And then he can say, well, I was being green, et cetera, et cetera. You can't really measure that. So I think it would be a huge step forward and I would oppose that. Okay, thank you. Maybe a huge step backwards, I, I meant to say, sorry. A step backwards, all right. <laughs> well, let's move on to that in just a few more moments. First off, uh, Professor Marin, what is your response? Um, I believe that we do need some institutional change. Um, if I look at Germany, what happened in German, Germany after the fall of communism is that firms in Germany threatened to go to Eastern Europe and produce there mm -hmm. in their wage bargaining mm -hmm. with, with uh, firms. Mm -hmm. So if you want globalization, the opening up of Eastern Europe um, led to a change in the institution in the in the institution of wage bargaining, and made unions much less powerful than they used to be, and that led in Germany to the so-called wage restraint. So wages really um, were increasing much less in Germany than in other countries. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, had an, an enormous efficiency push to Germany. So the German economy became much more efficient because on the, on the one hand, wages didn't increase as much as in other countries. Mm -hmm. So Germany gained competitiveness. But on the other hand, it also meant that firms went to, to produce in Eastern Europe and thereby lowering their cost because wages there were much less. So the German economy became very efficient, but in some sense at the expense of the workers. Mm. And um, I would give, even go much further. I would say that the fall of communism had also led also to the uh, decline of, of the era of social democracy. That's mm. what the, the era until, until the Berlin Wall, we had an era of social democracy. So that means that uh, uh, parties in power were mostly social democratic and introduced the welfare state and so on. Yes. So after the fall of the communism, um, Many of these leftist parties introduced uh, um, market principles and gave away uh, the idea of social protection mm -hmm. or as much social protection as it used to be. And uh, I think that was a mistake. You know, and part of the reason why people are so much against globalization is because they feel they haven't been gaining as much as other uh, other groups in society. They didn't gain a pie, a, a part of the pie. And the reason is, in my opinion, that it has something to do with the loss of power of unions. Mm -hmm. So when you look at research, we actually observe this because we observe in more in all of the rich countries, including the United States, that the labor share in the income, this is the income of the, the, the part of GDP that goes to workers. Uh, so the labor share and income has been declining from it from the mid uh, 80s to, to now substantially. And so there was a debate among economists, what's the reason for this? And there is one candidate explanation 
explanation is there is an increase in market power. Yeah. And the other explanation is that there is a loss in union power. And probably both of them uh, have, some, have, have some validity. But I think that if you think about um, how the future will look like, I think the, that the labor unions need to have uh, more of a say on the table than they had in the in, in the past. Okay. And part maybe I add something. Part of the reason why I believe so is that if you observe that globalization is in retreat and firms invest now more in robots, then it is important that the labor un the, 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 the unions take an active role in the direction of artificial intelligence that is going to happen in the future. Because in the past, um, there was a very strong focus on automation, replacing workers by robots. And I think we want to, to have a union that is in favor of technical change and okay. supporting it, <clears throat> but at the same time, to try to shape the direction of a technical change of artificial yeah. intelligence that is taking place. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, speaker. Mr. Nuls, what is your response? Should Europe impose reforms to make it possible to hold firms judicially accountable for their social mission statement or their purpose? You have to unmute yourself, Mr. Nuls. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I see. Thank um, you. Um, I think there's an elephant in the room. Um, this question, uh, apparently from your introduction, comes from an observation that um, European companies are too much concerned about their shareholders. Um, and that doesn't seem the case to me, because if I look to the, the statistics, and they are at my right-hand side, mm -hmm. over the last 15 years, so starting in 2006, before the financial crisis, until today, mm -hmm. Uh, European companies have something like 20% loss of profits. Now you may change the uh, starting point, but uh, even after the financial crisis, it's a bit like that. So the problem in Europe is that the model that we have installed uh, even before the financial crisis mm -hmm. doesn't deliver profits. Now this being said, uh, so there's a problem about capitalism about uh, general profitability of companies across Europe. And there might be exceptions. Uh, so there might be companies in Germany or in the Netherlands or in Belgium that make good profits, but they are rather the exception than the general trend. Yes. This being said, uh, if I may add uh, 10 seconds, I mm -hmm. think purpose is something uh, very important. And I think there is even a case to be made that uh, purpose could increase the profitability of companies. But what you propose should this so legal enforcement of purpose is something that um, even in a utopian uh, society is something very difficult because how will you judge the rightfulness of a purpose? And so I, yeah. I, I would like to stress the elephant in the room because you want to talk about capitalism. Mm -hmm. But don't quote me or don't uh, pull me in, in a debate as if European companies are making too much profits, because in general today, they don't. Mm. Thank you. That's a very good remark. Mr. Professor Boeri, what is your, finally, what's your response to the proposition? My, my answer is in an example. I don't know how many of you know the case of Parmalat. It was an Italian firm located in Parma. Many of you may know it because it was owning a, a soccer team that actually won also a European league once upon a time. Well, Parmalat was uh, universally acknowledged as being a socially responsible firm. It was uh, uh, involving workers, uh, apparently, in all major decisions and was mm -hmm. providing all type of support, uh, child care benefits and other type of services to their workers. At some point, it turned out it had been cooking the books and the firm went back bankrupt, ruining and destroying an entire community. Yeah. Um, so 
I really don't think that, uh, uh, you know, looking and trying, holding responsibility firms for, uh, you know, taking this type of stand is, is a productive way. of Firms should do well the job they should do, which is generally to maximize uh, the uh, value of a firm for the shareholders. We can encourage them to somewhat be more responsible by, for instance, having some kind of tax deduction for well-designed welfare schemes done in the firm. But providing social protection is not the business of a firm. It is the business of a state. Right. And that should be done very well. What yeah. we should be worried about is that uh, firms pay taxes. They don't elude taxation and they don't evade above all taxation. There are giants of the web that are not paying taxes nowadays. And we should make sure. And Europe can do something in this respect. Yeah. Yeah. Professor Boeri, you're a fan of Parma? Uh, not really, <laughs> but no. I, I, I went to the I'm final not, because I'm not, they... a support, I'm not a supporter of Parma, but uh, I was. Uh, I like Parma once. In a I time. went to the final. Um, you went? Yes, oh. yes. It was against my club, Antwerp, so a local club. <laughs> and there was a Belgian who was the captain of Parma. That's Georges Grun, who is very well known in the Netherlands because he eliminated uh, the Netherlands uh, to qualify for the World Championship. I <laughs> don't. For the funny interruption of <laughs> this uh, evening. Thank you for reminding Thank us. You, Thank Mr. you so Mills. much. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, the Netherlands and football is a complex uh, relations at the moment. Uh, let's uh, let's go let's go to the second statement. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, let's go to the second. So first. So thank you all. I think a clear no from all of you, except uh, Prof Professor Marin. She said, mentions that the labor force uh, is something that we should focus on, and uh, especially a very good remark from uh, Professor uh, for Mr. Newells uh, uh, as well about the how many firms have actually been profitable in Europe over the last years. So thank you very much for your first response to this proposition. Let's move on to the second one, everybody. So this is about another important thematic threat. Uh, which concerns uneven accumulation and distribution of wealth. Some of you have already mentioned that in your introductory statements. So Francois Bourguignon, he argues that although globalization has caused inequality between countries to diminish, inequality within countries has risen to new heights, even in Europe. Um, Professor Josh Ryan Collins points towards a combination of Western policy decision and overall financialization of housing markets. Instead of being a necessity in order for humans to live and flourish, over the years, housing has become a much more speculative activity in which many partake, especially the already well-off. And lastly, Joseph Stiglitz, who was here with us, he argues that wealth disparities are self-perpetuating and that it is produced by the vast amount of political power the wealthy hold to control legislative and regulatory activity. Although his analysis focuses primarily on the United States, he warns for the potentially devastating effects huge wealth disparities can have on Europe as well. This brings us to the second proposition of tonight. In order to curb further wealth disparities, Europe must implement rigorous wealth tax reforms. Professor um, Boyeri, let's start with you for now. What is your response to that? I think that, uh, no doubt, inequality is a major issue and one that should be taken very seriously. And in Europe, we have some experience in this respect. I don't think that uh, the solution is to really very much related to housing. Mm. That has been uh, perhaps the beginning of the financial crisis. You know, there was uh, this idea, the American dream of providing social housing and uh, uh, allowing people to get, uh, to, to be able to access capital markets to, um, uh, to buy a house. And yes. Has been, uh, you know, what has been uh, bringing to, uh, to to really to, to the crisis, to the financial crisis. So I don't think that's really the, the key thing. What we should do is to de design better uh, welfare system. We have a lot of experience in this respect. We can do extremely well. We can certainly do better than Asia and way better than the US uh, in this respect. I'm not sure. I understand what uh, what Luis Gallicano was saying before about the fact that uh, means-tested benefits are somewhat distortionary. I agree with that, but. Mm -hmm. There are ways to reduce uh, the, uh, the distortionary effect of a means-tested benefit. By means-tested means that you give money to those that who are really needy and they have a lower incomes and have a low uh, uh, inc also asset uh, condition in, in the family. Um, I'm not so sure that the universal basic income would work. The universal basic income would work in, uh, in, uh, in developing nations where we have little information about individuals and families and the mm. location of wealth and so, and mm. so on and so forth. So I really 
really would redesign the welfare system. And as I said also at the outset, I think another very important dimension and one that uh, we are learning very much about it uh, under the current juncture is health system. Health is no less important than income in providing support to families because we have huge differences in life expectancy across yep. uh, socioeconomic groups. And on that respect, we should do more because we have, we have been doing very little and there are too many different health systems in Europe. There is scope also for integrating health system in Europe because where we coordinated better, we would have faced the pandemic in a much a better and efficient way. It's not possible that if one country is uh, in a difficult situation, the other countries are not cooperating and helping out. There should be more cooperation in, uh, across Europe in providing health support. So more cooperation across Europe to provide support. Professor Garicano Gabilondo, what is your response to this and what is your response to um, what Professor Boeria said as well? Well, the first on your on your statement, I would think that uh, this is correct, that we should shift uh, to the extent possible taxes in the direction of wealth. Um, and particularly, as you were pointing out from uh, from one of your previous panelists towards uh, housing, which seems to be a place where, where a lot of the distortions have taken place in the past. Mm. Um, on on the Mr. Boris, on Tito Boris' uh, point about um, about means testing and basic income, um, I do agree that you can do means tested. And I mean, I'm exaggerating when I say I'm, I should we should do something totally not means tested. What I fear is that we are seeing a proliferation of different little schemes with housing, uh, 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 school, uh, and electricity entitlement, etc., that have the result overall of putting a huge tax on labor, basically. Um, what we see in Europe is that working, basically, in many of our countries doesn't pay. It's better to be, when you are receiving a lot of these benefits and when you have huge social security taxation uh, on people who work, the result is that it's better not to work or it pays very little to start working. Yes. My view then would be that uh, we need to try to remove all those distortions. I mean, I moderate a bit uh, in agreement with, with Tito. I moderate a bit my, my saying about non-means non testing, but, but basically reducing that interventionist kind of trying to the state, trying to get into the life of each person to see whether they need this and that and this and the other benefit and, and trying yeah. to have something a little bit more broad that allows us to help those who need it. Thank you. So not have the state involved in every part of everybody's life. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nules, what is your response? And perhaps could you also tie that into your first opening remarks in which you mentioned something about the roots of Europe and the uniqueness of the European economy? If the question is, do we need uh, more wealth taxes? Uh, the answer is it depends uh, in which country. And uh, there was another, uh, I think, indication that you found uh, real estate uh, too much untaxed. I think also that depends on, uh, on the country. Mm. And mm. the remarks from uh, the other uh, colleagues here in, uh, in the panel discussion that it doesn't pay to work. It also depends in which country. And yes. sometimes I have the impression that we see uh, inequality and uh, wealth creation and an extraordinary wealth creation mm -hmm. around the globe, which is very much concentrated in the US and that we want to do something about it in Europe. Mm -hmm. But the problem in Europe is wealth creation. And uh, we should rethink how we can do that because um, I think the, the, the remarks are, are always uh, coming up also. The state is very much involved yeah. And on the other hand, you want to do the state. You want the state to do even more. Now, this is a paradox. So let's have a debate on what the state should do. And as this is a discussion about Europe, let's start the discussion. What should the European uh, government, let's say Brussels, do, and what shouldn't they do anymore? Mm. And related to that, because more, more and more political power is shifting to the central banks. If you talk about wealth creation and some unequal wealth creation, it's a consequence of central bank policy, yep. and especially in, in real estate. So also there, I think the political um, uh, responsibility of what's happening with central bank policy should be discussed uh, extensively. 
Thank you. So let's first move to uh, Professor Marin on our first response and maybe also tie that into, I think, uh, Mr. Knowles' a uh, very good remark in which, what's the part, what's the role of Europe in, to play in this? Uh, I want to disagree with uh, Gerd Nels because the data show that uh, profits uh, have increased uh, over time in the last uh, two decades. And this is not only true for the US, this is true in all the European countries. So the profitability has increased, not declined. So this is, the, this is what the data mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is that, uh, yeah, I think that wealth inequality has a price. For, for, for instance, when you look at Germany, uh, the wealth, wealth inequality in Germany is among the largest in all countries, and um, yes, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't give you the picture, but I have the picture too, you know. <laughs> Maybe we measure it in a different way. But anyway, the wealth, it wealth, uh, it, the wealth distribution in Germany is among the most unequal in all the European countries. And there is a price you pay for wealth inequalities because Germany, uh, I was actually shocked when I saw this, but Germany is one of the countries with the least mobile social mobility. So, um, uh, so the price is the more unequal you, uh, you are, the more unequal the society is. Yes. The 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 lower is the social mobility. So, from what's your probability from becoming from getting a, 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 from a poor person to a, yeah. uh, to to the top ten percent, and this probability is lowest in Germany, mm. and that's quite. Uh, Boring, I think. Well, let's move first back to Mr. Newells. What What is your response to that? I think there is more in Europe than Germany. And uh, I agree that uh, some things in Germany have been uh, uh, derailing. In uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the unions and you mentioned also uh, some of the... Uh, the low wages, and, and that's probably true, but I thought the discussion was on Europe, Europe as a whole, mm -hmm. where there, are, there is a lot of uh, diversity, and I'm looking at the figures of Europe as a whole, uh, for instance, in terms of profitability, mm -hmm. and trying to get a grip on what we should uh, do with European policy, and uh, what German polit politicians should, should do is a different discussion. Mr. Professor Boeri, Germany what do you, what is do you... one country in Europe. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Germany so. is one country in Europe. So, uh, so the experience matters that Germany has, no? Yes, uh, but then we should change the discussion and talk about the German economy, which is an interesting subject, <laughs> uh, obviously. <laughs> but that's a different debate. I think it's an important one, but I thought we, we, we would discuss European capitalism. Yeah. Yes. And so let's stick to that subject, uh, but I leave the word to the moderator. Yes. Well, let, let's move to Professor Boeri. What, is, what should Europe do in this regard? What, is the poss what are the possibilities for Europe? You mentioned um, a couple of things already. Well, I think Europe has been uh, developing its own capacity to borrow and uh, in capital markets and, you know, programs yep. like uh, the recovery fund yep. that I think is more, uh, should be called uh, next generation EU because it, uh, it should in principle look at uh, uh, the prospect of young people in Europe and uh, most of the attention should be uh, done uh, of in, in defining the program should be should be done in, in that in that respect mm -hmm. I think it has to develop also its fiscal capacity and you know being able to raise uh, uh, taxes uh, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, get revenues uh, on its own because otherwise this uh, type, type of capacity will not last long and 
as I was already saying before, I think the uh, the key ingredient of this should be one of intervening on the giants of the web, on these uh, multinational firms that are yeah. operating cross-border. And uh, unless there is a really coordination across Europe in this, uh, in mm -hmm. this effort to tax collection, uh, I don't think uh, individual countries going alone would do much in this respect. So that, I think, is something that should be done. And in terms of what to do with this money, I think uh, I said already before, I think yeah. the key feature of the European identity are, one, uh, being the land of redistribution, the land uh, you know, that has been fighting poverty mm -hmm. uh, more effectively than many other parts of the world. And also, I think it should be more. One that provides uh, better access to health systems and uh, uh, try to prevent large differences in uh, life expectancy, because these are those that really determine the fact that there is unequal opportunities and there is not the social mobility uh, 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 Martin was 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 talking about. Uh, yes. uh, Laila Martin was talking about. Marine was talking about before. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so we have to move on to the third proposition. Time is flying, as they say. Um, so let's move on to the last thematic threat that we've uh, un unveiled in this entire series, which is the green transition. So all of our speakers in one way or another have argued the necessity to limit economic activities that threaten to destroy our livelihood and our habitat on Earth. For example, Julia Steinberger advocates a degrowth strategy. She takes a self-proclaimed radical stance and thinks that it's impossible to curtail damaging economic activity enough within a for-profit capitalist logic. The current system, she says, favors and produces consumption and every added of con unit of consumption is irreconcilable with the necessity for less growth. And Pettifor, on the other hand, praises the European Green Deal. Governments should take the lead in the green transition, since we cannot rely on firms to take measure in their own hands within the necessary time frame. She advocates a green growth strategy. And lastly, Jeffrey Sachs, he takes yet another approach. He analyzes the challenges of achieving economic growth while protecting the environment and achieving an equitable distribution of resources. And he favors an approach along the lines of SDGs, the Social Sustainable Development Goals, which he co-developed, obviously, which is also a green growth strategy. Now, this brings us to the third and final proposition, which I'd like to um, pose you all. Uh, Europe must implement reforms that stimulates consumers and businesses towards degrowth. Professor uh, Garitiano Gabilondo, let's start with you. What do you think of this proposition? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. All right. Strongly no. Let me let me let me say uh, why. So I think there are two strands in the environmental movement mm -hmm. uh, among the green uh, movement. One is the let's say Greta Thunberg strand that wants us to all have our own apple tree and eat our own apples by our garden in our house and yes. that's it. And there's another strand that says growth is necessary and we need to all kind of make sure that that growth is greener. Mm. The first thing I want to say is that, uh, I mean, I think the first, um, the first view is incompatible with our current system. I think that... Um, Everything from pensions to debt to social security to uh, it, it requires a certain amount of growth to be sustainable. But also um, notice that contrary to what one of the, the persons that you mentioned that, that supported this, I, I don't remember who it was, a woman who supported the degrowth strategy, the first speaker that you mentioned. Yes. Um, consumption, she said, well, every, consum every unit of consumption damages the planet. Notice that that is not really the case because uh, consumption is increasingly massless. We are now consuming, viewers who are watching this are consuming video. There is no atoms involved, no CO2 has been used. Um, my kids are playing on their phone computer games. The presents that I do them for Christmas don't have mass. I, I give them a, a present which is a video game that they download and that they play. Another person can be music, which is on Spotify. We don't make LPs. We don't make books. We don't make, I mean, most of the things we're not making anymore. All right. I, I would say if you wanted to weight GDP, to weight in a scale, mm -hmm. the GDP today versus the GDP 100, 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't be surprised if it's lighter. 
because a lot of the GDP we produce, certainly per unit of per dollar, it's lighter, that's for sure. Uh, think about Facebook, the big companies that have grown, Facebook, Google, I mean, they don't produce anything. They produce electrons. And electrons don't really uh, pollute the environment. Okay, there is some energy that is used, but but it's it's minimal. The energy to produce a Kindle book and download it compared to the mm. energy to produce an old-fashioned thick book, all the trees that go into paper, etc. Clear, yes. So the second point is consumption does not necessarily mean we kill the environment. And I think there is something much easier than this degrowth strategy, which is a system that we have in Europe that we have to substantially improve, mm -hmm. which is the emission trading scheme. Mm -hmm. We have a scheme that says we have a certain amount of carbon that is allowed. People pay for this carbon. And they can trade. So the one that has a lower cost of reducing the carbon consumption does the investment. And we, between all of us, we decrease little by little in Europe how much carbon is produced until we get to zero by 2050 or 2040, or maybe even earlier. Who knows if, if we decide to tighten the standards Europe-wide. Yes. So we need to expand this to the rest of the world. Happily, China, the biggest news this year that was covered by COVID has been that China has joined this effort, and China was our biggest worry. China is going to introduce an ETS to have a huge hugely ambitious global uh, warming uh, target, uh, CO2 reduction target. And, and, and my view is that these two things are going to be compatible. We're going to yep. invest a lot, and that's going to produce growth yep. into the Green Deal, into reducing pollution, and we have to go in that direction. If we tell our citizens... We, don't, we want you to stop going to on holiday because we want to degrow, and we want you to stop buying stuff if you want to degrow. We will have the gilet jaune. I mean, the proposition you, uh, like in France, the proposition you put on the table, in my view, would be politically and economically unsustainable. Unsustainable, Thank yes. Thank you. Um, Professor Marin, what is your response to that? I think that there is no conflict between green and uh, growth. In, in, in the contrary, I think that that's the, the, the beauty of the capitalist system, that once you have this, uh, this aim of getting a green economy, there will be firms innovating in green technology yeah. and making growth and green go together. One example for this is, look at the race for a vaccine now against the pandemic. There was a race and look at this. Very quickly, uh, firms came up with a solution to, 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 to fight the pandemic. Yeah. So that's the, here, I believe in the market, absolutely, mm -hmm. that the market will make sure that if we want to have a greener economy, uh, the market will have the end end. You, you, you give the state uh, to provide an incentive for firms to uh, innovate in green technology. So the state has a role here, actually. Yeah. And yes, so they don't, they, they are no conflict. Yeah, no conflict. State has a role. Um, Professor Boeri, what do you think of that? I think that depicting environmental policies as a sort of luxury good and suggesting that we need to reduce growth rates to allow for a better environment is a mm -hmm. recipe to give power to the populist across the world uh, because it would mean making the poor even poorer and uh, you know, creating a conflict that can absolutely be avoided, as also been said before. I think we are coming out of this pandemic with a better knowledge by people of the notion of externality. Mm. Uh, the layperson has realized that uh, they uh, are somewhat affected by the behavior of other people because you know, they, if they meet someone on the street, they can be contagious by COVID-19, and by yeah. the same uh, uh, terms, they can be uh, by the same token, they are now more aware, I think, of the external effect of erection and the effect on the environment. Mm. So I think we should build on this awareness and uh, um, devise environmental policies, properly measuring the cost and benefit of these policies. Often these things are not being seriously being taken into account. For instance, the effect of environmental policies on uh, health is not properly measured. And uh, clearly health has a major implication for the well-being of individuals 
materials and also for the uh, fiscal costs themselves. Mm. Uh, so I think, uh, and uh, also w where policies have been uh, taking place, they also uh, have been uh, really involving way less, uh, uh, you know, even strictly financial costs than those that were envisaged before. So I think uh, uh, really we have to create and build up on this awareness of externalities and externalities, uh, yeah. do more for the environment without uh, reducing growth. It is possible to reconcile the two things. And indeed, after the financial crisis, a lot of investment has been taking place on the green economy. And uh, I think uh, we will have a benefit also in the long term from this investment and more perhaps will take place with the uh, uh, next generation EU fund. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Knowles, what do you think of that? And what do you think of the, do you have any thoughts on the European New Green Deal? I think I can join uh, most of what he said of the previous speakers and uh, those who suggest degrowth, I think they probably don't know what growth is. It's uh, uh, mostly also a human ambition to solve problems and to improve uh, its situation. Mm -hmm. So if you put forward the degrowth agenda, you create a lot of uh, frustration and a lot of uh, human beings that cannot develop themselves anymore and yes. can't solve problems like COVID anymore. Yeah. There are two conditions, of course, and uh, they, they can be summed up with sustainability uh, or leaving uh, a good situation for the next generation, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of uh, climate impact, but also in terms of financial impact. And we, uh, we should be careful uh, about the first, of course, but also about the second. And that's uh, also related to debt. Now, the Green New Deal is, um, on the one hand, uh, a very clear statement that uh, Europe wants to go forward and be a leader, a worldwide leader in uh, the climate uh, challenge yeah. and sees it as a competitive edge. I think, on the other hand, typical European error of doing it top down. Uh, thinking that you know the solutions already, uh, limiting, limiting a lot of uh, entrepreneurial uh, effort and innovation mm. and, uh, let's say, surprises of where the solutions might come. Mm. Uh, and so uh, going forward with an agenda in which uh, lobbies and big companies always have an advantage. And mm. so um, I applaud the ambition. I think it's a missed opportunity to uh, think that Europe top down from Brussels, uh, trickle down to the bottom, can decide what good uh, climate activities are uh, and underestimate what an entrepreneurial uh, climate they could have created instead. Yes. So I'm more in favor of what has uh, suggested by the previous uh, speakers also by setting certain, um, uh, let's say, a, a framework like the ETS uh, framework, which, mm. which could be a very good uh, way of uh, incentivizing uh, companies. Yes. Professor Garicano Gabilondo, you've mentioned in your opening statement you don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, do you believe the European Green Deal, just like Mr. Newell said, is too much top-down, possibly, and doesn't um, make the full use of the entrepreneurial potential in Europe? Um, it remains to be uh, to be seen. I understand his concern, and I think it's well taken. I think there is a a, a risk that uh, there are no impact assessments and things are are, are taken. Uh, uh, in a in too dirigist uh, manner, mm -hmm. um, but I think we are still on time to uh, to make sure that those investments are are smart. Mm -hmm. um, I think the absence of the UK from uh, from the European Union is a bad news for the ideological balance of the Union. We have uh, a clear um, move towards a system that has much more uh, dependence on centralized solution mm -hmm. as, 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 as Herr Nulls uh, said um, and, and we know, I mean, wh why do we live in capitalism? Apart from freedom we believe that local knowledge is is, is the base, that people know um, what, what Herr is calling uh, the entrepreneurial spirit I mean, people know what they want when they go to the shop and they decide that they don't want coffee because coffee is too expensive. Yeah. 
uh, we don't have to decide who doesn't buy coffee when there is a freeze in Brazil. People mm -hmm. who don't like coffee as much switch to tea, and people who are depending on coffee stay on coffee. Yes. And and we need to use those kinds of mechanisms for for greening. And the most best mechanism we have is the is the ETS. Let me just tell you, like I'm working. Uh, I wrote the opinion for for the economics. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Economics uh, Committee of the European Parliament, and I'm working on something called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, okay. which basically tries to expand the ETS, but making sure that people outside the Union have to pay, countries outside the Union have to pay for the carbon that they used if they didn't pay in their home country. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of smart policy that expands this, this ETS and that makes sure that everybody has yes. at the end to make those efforts to green the environment. All right. Thank you, everyone. Unfortunately, our 15 minutes of this proposition are already over, and we have to move over to the final part of tonight. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and of course, it, it always feels a bit strange. I mean, we can talk about every sentence all of you spoke. We could talk about that for an hour or even longer. Um, so, so the final question would, if you would... Um, propose a institutional reform or a new institutional approach or something in the European Union? Because, of course, Mr. Null said we are talking about Europe, right? Not of individual countries. What would that proposition be? Would we have a, as already is mentioned, would we have a fiscal strategy and different fiscal policies? And what would we, what would we tax? Uh, or would it be something else? What, what would you suggest as an institutional reform to create that European market economy, which is uh, 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 more uh, solving more problems than it is solving today. Um, you already, of course, mentioned that we should not throw away uh, uh, the, the child with the bath water, uh, so that we also should be proud of what we have created already here. Uh, let me first go to Mr. Nuls, who was quite quite, quite um, expressive already in that he wants to propose some, some changes in the institutional uh, framework of the European Union union right to create an, a different market economy well yes i think that uh, um, europe should learn also from its mistakes but also learn from where it started um, and it started with uh, a very sound vision i think about subsidiarity and uh, that's something that uh, europe should uh, always keep in mind when going forward um, so also from time to time decentralized. There are a lot of things that can be better managed on uh, a more local level. Where the, the general level is concerned, I think we are in a dangerous uh, situation in which the European Central Bank is becoming uh, a kind of, um, let's say, non-democratic institution that uh, believes strongly in a plant economy. Mm. And I think there the, uh, the balance should be uh, better and that uh, more political debate should be done about the real mandate of the European Central Bank uh, mm. before we stabilize the whole system. That is that is a clear suggestion what we should uh, discuss about. Uh, let's let's go to Professor Marin. What should be the what is your proposition for an institutional uh, reforming uh, the institutions of the EU? EU. I, I think uh, Europe needs to face the artificial intelligence uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. I think this is something, I mean, the Chinese are dealing with it by, by pushing, pushing it very much so by the state, by state capitalism. And I think that Europe needs to think about this uh, in the future, because if you don't want to have social polarization worsening in the future, uh, dealing with how the future of artif artificial intelligence goes is something that needs to be taken care of. And uh, I already said that what is important is to get incentives with firms, incentives by firms mm -hmm. to go into new jobs with artificial intelligence rather than to replace only old jobs 
So, so to face the, the opportunity that this technology is giving us to create something new rather than to replace something old. Yes. So I think this is a major point. I dare to disagree uh, about uh, the ECB as a central planner. Um, uh, I don't think that this is a, 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 that this is a good description of the central bank. Yeah, it's it's clear that we should host a debate between the two of you. Uh, 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 let, let let us go to Professor Garigan and Gabi Londo. I have no doubt, and it's one that comes also in the first statement by my colleague uh, Tito Boeri. And I know it's a harder one to say in the Netherlands. Uh, corporations in Europe are not paying taxes. Uh, this is uh, big corporations. Um, and let me just give you an example. Netflix, two years ago, paid total taxes in Spain of 2,000 euros. Any little bookstore in Madrid, any little kiosk in the Ramblas <laughs> paid more in Barcelona, paid more taxes than Netflix paid in Spain. This is true for Netflix, it's true for Apple, it's true for Google, mm. it's true for many, many other companies. Yeah. Um, it's not only internet companies, it's also true for Nike or for Starbucks, who had all the beans that they were selling in in, uh, in the UK, produced in a hugely um, coffee-producing country, yes. which is Luxembourg and Switzerland. I mean, these are the places where coffee gets grown in Europe. Everybody knows that because yes. of their tropical climates. <laughs> um, so not, of course. So, so we have a real problem there of equity, of distribution, of resources for our welfare states. And we open up the capital mobility before solving this. And I would encourage you to drop some of those most crazy kind of uh, statements and think of this question, which I know it's more controversial in the Netherlands, but it's extremely important for the future of Europe, in my opinion. Clear. Now, you also know that we uh, host actually the band U2 in the Netherlands. You know that. Uh, uh, the, what, the what? Sorry, uh, there? The band U2. We exactly have, because that's because that's a Dutch the, band you know that yes of yeah. course exactly, uh, exactly. Thank, thank thank you for 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 that and let's go to the last uh, last speaker uh, 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 professor Bueri. what is your what is your uh, suggestion for institutional reform in the eu well i don't think there is a single institution that could do the job i think the most important thing is that we should you know we protect and support our uh, kind of uh, democratic uh, capitalism because you know the type of capitalism that are uh, present across the world are different you know if you look at asia clearly this is a political capitalism without uh, allowing for much uh, democracy i think the democratic system are better to also handle the type of uh, things that we should do, redistribution, uh, especially if they are supported by appropriate checks and balances that uh, allow minorities to have a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, clearly, the uh, type of redistribution which is needed will not really go uh, to people who are really uh, needy uh, and uh, need uh, to, to have that uh, type of support. So in that sense, I think I'm fully uh, uh, supportive of, uh, of the fight that uh, the European Parliament is making now, is, is having uh, with some countries uh, in Europe, in new accession countries in terms of the, of the fundamental rights. That's really something extremely important. I think we can also be more effective in uh, dealing with externalities, where sometimes uh, uh, systems that are less democratic can, can be better in some principle to deal with externalities. Mm. But uh, uh, insofar as we get more coordinated at the European level, insofar as uh, we, we improve democracy at the European level, we democratize Europe, we can also handle externalities in a better way than yeah. Done elsewhere in yeah. Europe, yeah. In, Thank you. in the world. Thank you so much. Let's go for the final thoughts of this evening. Back to the young economist Jim Suri. Uh, what is your what is your what are your final thoughts on this conversation? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much to all the uh, invitees. It was a very fruitful uh, discussion indeed. So I uh, segmented my reflections in three uh, topics. First of all, I want to talk about some general remarks. So I really like the quote made by uh, someone who said that uh, we don't have to copy the United States of uh, China. 
So uh, I think we have to centralize the power, so to say, of citizens instead of centralize the power of the market or centralize the power of the state. And uh, as a concrete example, you can look to, to data, data sovereignty. Mm. So in America, in America, you have uh, the market who owns the data in China, the state, whereas here in Europe, we can have the ability to uh, give the people the power back of their own uh, data. I think that's important. Um, I also like the idea of uh, that the, the working force in Europe needs more voting power. Um, so th that's, that's a way of power distribution. Um, the second remark I wanted to make is about wealth uh, distribution. So uh, a lot of has been said about uh, taxation. I think it's a good idea to, uh, yeah, to, to, to shift away from labor towards wealth and uh, profits by, by all firms. So as, also from uh, Netflix in, uh, in Spain to, to pay their uh, fair share. Um, and in this, we have to find a better way for our welfare system in order to fulfill all needs of uh, citizens. So, so we have no poverty left. Um, everyone can get a house, for example. Everyone can get good health care and good education. And in my opinion, we have to organize a system around those uh, values as a, as a yeah. core issue. Uh, and the last point was related to uh, ecology. So the question if we needed degrowth or uh, green growth. But for me, the most important thing is that we centralize uh, nature again in our society. So we see a tremendous loss in biodiversity, a decline in soil, air, uh, water. And I think if we centralize uh, that to restore it, then we can... Um, design an economy around it and we can also have forms of economic growth which do not harm these uh, natural uh, values clear um, thank you so much for that uh, for, the, for those remarks uh, thank you uh, our international guests for joining us in this very short and very dense discussion um, uh, thank you for the to the viewers for watching and for all your uh, ideas and also the questions Evelyn Verhagen thank you well thank you so much for asking all these questions every 10 uh, all 10 editions and then um, uh, this is this was it and the only thing I, I would like like to uh, 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 and thank you David of course for joining us uh, uh, to doing this this project together um, the only thing uh, I have to say is um, uh, if you want to be uh, part of the next stage of this project we have a message for you after this show uh, a short video on that but thank you for now thank you in our project rethinking the future of capitalism is achieved by Presenting visionary economists and discussing capitalism in 10 online dialogues. And writing an important report on the future of capitalism in Europe. We invite you to participate in this exciting and vitally important project. How? If you have a great idea on the role of government, business or civil society, you can write a viewpoint. If you are working in academia or a business, you can spread this movie within your network. Next, you can also subscribe on our website to continue receiving information about our project. Last but not least, if you are a student or young researcher, you can make a very real contribution by participating in our essay contest. We invite you to send in your ideas on the future of capitalism. Write an essay about the role of government, business or the local community and win one of our prizes. Want to know more? Go to www.moralmarkets.org slash future market consultation for more information about this exciting project. Let's get in touch.